This is Unsilo brought to you by Alumni FM, connecting people through stories. Welcome to Unsiloed. This is uh, Greg LeBlanc, and I'm here today with uh, with Mike Ryan, who is a professor of uh, integrative biology at the University of Texas in, in Austin, uh, and also the author of uh, this book right here, um, uh, Taste for the Beautiful, um, The Evolution of, of Attraction, and is also uh, the world's leading expert on Tungara frogs, I, I imagine. <laughs> and of course, today we're going to talk about frogs, of course, but we'll talk about other animals and, you know, we'll, we'll speculate about, about humans, which is my uh, preferred a- animal. Um, and, and so this book is, is about beauty, or it's, to be more specific, it's about sexual uh, beauty in, across the species. And it, it builds on this insight that, that Darwin made, uh, you know, in his career, he, he, he said he, the peacock's tail made him nauseous, right, when he, after he wrote his, his first book. And this inspired him to develop a whole new theory, uh, which paralleled, right, natural selection, which was called uh, sexual selection. And ever since, uh, we've been puzzling over, right, how important sexual selection is uh, relative to natural selection, whether they're kind of uh, in, in alignment or, or in conflict, and um, and you've introduced a, a I think a, a really important twist, uh, an entirely uh, new theory uh, about, or at least an entirely new uh, explanation for how sexual selection gets uh, off off and running. Um, and so I'm really glad to have you here today, Mike, to talk about it. Welcome. Thank you. Good to be here. To be there, <laughs> <laughs> wherever well, well, we are. Well, maybe just to start off, uh, I'm wondering if you could. Uh, recap for us uh, exactly how sexual selection differs from uh, natural selection, if if at all. I mean, look, it, it obviously it, it makes sense that um, you know if you have characteristics which uh, help you to um, be more successful in the reproduction game, uh, this is something that you know you would want your offspring to have, and and so presumably. You know, you're you're going to try and choose a mate that gives those uh, characteristics to to your offspring, um, but but why do we need an entirely separate theory of of selection in order to kind of explain the dynamics of this attraction? Well, and that's a good question. Uh, some people consider sexual selection as a subset of natural selection, a type of natural selection, and uh, Darwin clearly proposed it as a parallel theory. But if you consider it, you know, within the realm of sexual selection, that's fine, too. Uh, That works. The the important thing is that we understand that selection is acting on different functions. So the emphasis in Darwin's first book on the origin of species was the evolution of adaptations for survivorship. Mm -hmm. And this is why he had this strong reaction to the peacock's tail. So after he publishes on the origin of species, he's then thinking about variation in animals throughout the animal kingdom. And there are lots and lots of traits that clearly don't uh, foster survivorship, don't enhance survivorship. And the peacock's tail is uh, emblematic of that. That's kind of the poster child for sexual selection. So then, you know, then what Darwin proposed, it's it's very simple. It's that, well, natural selection favors traits for you to survive. But if you survive and you don't reproduce, then you're not passing your genes on to the next generation. And sexual selection, he suggested, promotes the ability of individuals to acquire mates. And this is what a lot of these um, elaborate traits, like the peacock's tail, would do. They would att- females would find them sexually more attractive. So this is where the idea of sexual beauty comes. But then the controversy. So this uh, this idea of sexual selection wasn't readily accepted by Darwin's closest supporters, like Alfred Wallace and Huxley, did not support this idea of sexual selection, especially the mate choice component of it. Uh, And they asked, well, then why should females prefer males? 
that have characters that reduce their survivorship. And again, Darwin said, well, if, if the survivorship and the mate, mating success balance out, then you should have selection for these uh, attractive traits. But the, it, but the peacock's tail, if it got too long, then it, would, then it wouldn't evolve because the males would be very sexy to the females, but they would die before they had a chance to uh, attract her. Right. So I think that this conventional view uh, within the sexual selection world is that the these big tails and so forth, they're effectively kind of costly signals, right? So, you know, if you could somehow signal that you were uh, somehow better than your your peers um, at zero cost, right, that would be fantastic. But unfortunately, that's 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 impossible, right? Because it has to be something which is is costly. It has to cost more for uh, the 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 bad types than it does for the good types, right? And so you need this kind of you know sorting equilibrium to, to take place. Um, and so, it, is is the costly signaling model really the the only model out there that can kind of make sense of what's going on? No, there's there's a there's a couple of uh, different ways to ex- to explain why these particular traits evolve or specifically why females should prefer them. So the costly trait, it's also called the handicap principle. And the idea is that only males of high vigor, physical fitness, uh, can afford to have these, again, think of the peacock, and to have these, uh, to have these long tails. And if there's a genetic basis for this physical vigor, then the female's offspring and the male's offspring would benefit by passing down these uh, good genes for survivorship. So that's one way it could work. Another way it could work is pretty is a tricky idea, and it's called runaway sexual selection. So if you have genetic variation in a male trait and genetic variation in the female preference for that trait, you want to remember that the genes for the male trait and the female preference are carried by both males and females, is what we think usually, not all the time. But only males express the male traits and only females express the female preference. So you can have a situation where the alleles that favor the long tail, using the peacock example again, and the alleles that... that um, promote females to prefer the long tails, these two become statistically correlated. So then they evolve together. Selection, the males evolve the alleles for longer tails because they're preferred by females. There's no direct selection on the female preference. The term that that was used to describe it once is the these preference genes, gen, um, there's genetic hitchhiking. They just go through generation after generation because they're statistically correlated. And then, a, and then a third idea, and these aren't mutually exclusive, but the third idea, the one we've been uh, working on the most, and, and many others, is this idea of sensory drive or sensory exploitation. So sexual advertisement is a kind of communication. In any communication, the signals need to stand out against background noise. This is, you know, this is the basis for uh, information theory when it was developed at uh, at Bell Labs, you know, a, a, quite a long time ago. So when the males when the males display, they need to be loud and large and brightly colored and have overwhelming pheromones, and you and those need to evolve in the context of what the females can detect. So the females can see different colors, they can hear different sounds. And Darwin said, not in his sexual selection book, but in his next book on the emotion of uh, emotions in man and animal, that the males are going to make those kinds of sounds that are already uh, pleasing to the female. So these traits are going to be filtered by what the animal perceives, what it can perceive and how it, how it makes decisions. 
So the brain is the brain is in that sense a very important sex organ of the female, but the brain has other things on its mind. So fishes, for instance, will evolve photopigments in their eyes to let them best see the prey given the light spectrum in the ocean. And then males, it appears males then next evolve colors that match this photopigment sensitivity in the females. And we, and we find the same thing with the, uh, with the frogs and the frog claws that we study. The tuning of the inner ear is already in place. And then males then evolve calls that exploit, that match this uh, inner ear tuning. Now that doesn't mean that there can't be good genes. That doesn't mean that there can't be runaway sexual selection. But, but people had always been looking at this from the point of view of the male's display. What's that telling the female about the male without realizing that we really need to look at these displays not just through the eyes, but through the eyes and the nares and basically the brain of the female. So this, this is the theory of uh, sensory exploitation that you introduced. Right. And, and, you know, I, I find it fascinating. Um, I interviewed uh, Rob Dunn uh, a while back and, you know, he, he, he asked the question, you know, why, why does, why does nobody uh, think about, you know, deliciousness, right? <laughs> think about why, yeah. you know, why do we pursue certain foods over, over others? And, and I think, you know, here you're you're really asking the question of you know why is the the why is what we consider beautiful actually you know beautiful, right? Exactly. And and and, and some and you say that sometimes it's it preexists kind of the the mating game, right? That there is it's not that you know because I think most people who who have been thinking about this from an evolutionary perspective think that everything that we see is as beautiful has its origins in kind of uh, you know a sexual brain. Um, but but you're saying that sometimes the 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 brain has is pre-wired for attraction or desire, and it's the um, uh, sexual mating game that kind of hijacks that existing existing circuitry, right? Is exactly. that a good? Yeah, yeah, exactly. And a good human analogy is the way that our um, dopamine reward system which is important in human attraction as well as uh, animal attractions to sexual beauty. But in humans, that dopamine reward system is hijacked by cocaine. Mm -hmm. It's hijacked by overeating and it's hijacked by pornography. So, so in some sense, the, the, the males are uh, hijacking that female circuitry, but, but in, in another way, as you say, the females are really the, the biological puppeteers who are uh kind exactly. of you know getting the the men to the males to engage in this in this crazy dance um and so in, in that sense you you know you're really digging into the brain as as a sexual organ and the thing about the the sexual brain is that it is both the the agent and and the target in exactly. in evolution which makes it unique right i mean normally we think about okay we've got these environmental factors like uh you know temperature which um, you know, lead to some evolutionary target like fur, but 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 you're arguing that, that, that the brain evolves both to signal and to detect the signal um, simultaneously. Yeah, exactly. So the so the female and the female brain, they're agents of selection because they generate selection on the males. They determine who gets to mate, who gets to pass on their genes, but they're also the target of selection. Because if those preferences backfire, so for instance, if they mate with the wrong species, then usually they're not going to have any offspring. So then there's going to be evolution of the female preference. So it becomes the target. And that is, uh, that is very unusual, if not unique, that one aspect of a phenotype can both generate selection and be the target, be the target of selection. Well, could you tell us a bit about how did you come across this theory? I mean, you, you detail the work that you did with, with the frogs and the way in which they can hear, hear the, the croaks of the, of the male frogs. Could you, could you maybe just talk about, like, how did this aha moment happen to you? Yeah, well, it's um, fro the frog's auditory system. It's a little different than ours. You know, we have one inner ear that perceives sound, one on either side of the head. And the frogs have two on each side of the head. 
one is most sensitive to lower frequencies, the other is most sensitive to higher frequencies. So there's about 7,000 species of frogs. Almost all of them make calls that indicate what species they are. And they match, the frequencies in the call match these sweet spots in one of these two inner ear organs or both of them. So there had been a lot of uh, studies of the neurobiology of frog hearing. And this was done in the context of species recognition. How is the brain wired to, to drive females to prefer males of their own species mm -hmm. rather than other species? And I think you mentioned that's like the key, like that's the first step, right? Before you exactly. start figuring out whether, you know, this is a good one or a bad one, you first have to figure out whether it's the right, right species. And, and, you know, I, I was, I, I never thought of this as a, as a major problem <laughs> in my life, well, we, but apparently yeah, it's a we, big deal, right? Well, we don't. When's the last time you heard of uh, you heard of someone partnering up with a chimpanzee <laughs> because they couldn't tell the difference? But it was a problem for humans because where do these Neanderthal genes mm -hmm. that we all possess where did they come from? Well, they came from humans and Neanderthals uh, mating at some point in our history. But so anyway, that was um, these neuro, neurobiology studies in the context of species recognition were well known. And I started doing my thesis work just as this idea of sexual selection was being resuscitated. And the person, the a faculty member, when I was a grad student, a faculty member down the hall was kind of the giant in unraveling how the, how the brain assigns value to sounds in the environment mm -hmm. and he and he worked on frogs so then i decided to take that general philosophical approach and apply it to sexual selection well we can ask how the brain results in females preferring their own their own species can we ask how the brain is influencing females make choice within a species and that and again that was um that was before people were thinking of mate choice within a species very much. It was it wasn't until the late seventies that people, you know, started studying mate choice and sexual selection. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and so, so these pre-existing kind of uh, brain wirings. Uh, one example that you use is uh, kind of coloration, right? And so, you know, we all know that uh, males tend to have, you know, elaborate color coloration schemes right particularly you know reds and yellows and so forth and and you argue that the the species that have this right they also are the species that um need this uh, kind of color detection in order to forage right mm -hmm. including humans yeah 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 in, including humans and it's the same thing with uh with auditory sensitivity as well but it's, you know, it's not to say that that selection for choosing appropriate mates um, is always subservient to these other functions, to these other domains. But we, we do need to remember that the brain has lots of things to do, lots of different tasks. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we don't have one module in our brain for listening to music and another module in our brain to talking to, to offspring and another module in our brain talking to strangers. I mean, we have, you know, we have a language capacity and then we use, we have to use that in many, many different uh, domains of social function. So you talk about some examples of how, you know, in the, in the lab or in the field, you can run these manipulations where you can, uh, you know, alter the features of, of the males. And um, by altering the features of the males, you can, kind of not only uncover hidden preferences, but, but also kind of um, identify that, that some of these preferences, they, they really know no bounds, right? So it's, it's not like there's a certain, um, you know, level of optimal level of, of brightness, but if you are interested in brightness, then, there's, you know, you're just going to chase after the, the maximum brightness. And, and the only reason why the species have not gone in that direction is because there's presumably some, some other trade-off that uh, constrains their capacity to kind of go uh, it, it to the extreme supernormal direction. 
Exactly, exactly. I mean, for example, uh, in mate choice and moths, it's um, it's the opposite. The females are choosing males, and they prefer males that can flap their wings faster. And the rate of wing flapping in the males is in the the low hertz or or, or the teens. I forget exactly. Let's say it's you know, ten to fifteen times per second. But this is a, a very old study. They made this um, flapper machine in Germany. And what they found is that the females would prefer these flapping rates going up to, I think, like 100 cycles per second. Now, no male can make that, can flap that fast. And the, at the point that the uh, preference for flapping rate starts, where it doesn't matter if you get hot, much higher than, let's say, 100 hertz, it's because of the moth side, because that's where its flicker fusion rate is. Mm -hmm. So once you get above the flicker fusion rate of the moth, where everything now appears to be smooth, mm -hmm. then the preference stops. So, you know, that's a very old example, but, you know, a useful example of how you have these uh, constraints. And there's lots of studies with fishes that, uh, that parallel our studies with frogs, where you can use models, either video playbacks or or wooden models of fishes, and you can just add so many things to these models and the females still prefer them. And with the tundra frogs, they make, um, they have an interesting mating call, I'll imitate it for you. The first part of it has a whine and it sounds like this. And the females have to, the whine is both necessary and sufficient to draw the attention of the female. She'll mate with the male producing only a whine. But then the males can add these chucks to the end of the wine. They can add up to seven of those. So, yeah. And the females, prefer, we call it a complex call if it has a chuck. Females prefer complex calls to simple calls, and they perform more chucks mm -hmm. to fewer chucks. But the wine is the species recognition part of it. If you mess with the wine too much, because we can synthesize all these sounds, if you mess with the wine too much, then the females won't respond to it. The chucks, we found a couple of dozen sounds that we can use to replace the chuck, and the females still find the, these uh, calls more attractive than only a wine. In fact, when we were doing this study, my late colleague said, uh, it's almost like any, any bell or whistle at the end of the call makes this more attractive to females. So then we synthesize a whine followed by a bell and a whistle, and they preferred that to a whine by itself. So the chuck has this amazing sexual potency. It increases the male's attractiveness uh, fivefold. I mean, think in humans, what could we do to our appearance to make us, you know, five times more sexually attractive? And metabolically, it doesn't cost the frogs anything to uh, to burp at the end of their call. Mm -hmm. There's another cost, and that's this predation cost. Mm -hmm. They There's these bats that home in on the calls, and they're attracted to uh, wines, but also wines with chucks. But, but the point is, getting back to these hidden preferences, we can replace these sounds with a whole variety of sounds, and the females still prefer them. Now, with the wine, as I said, if you mess with the wine too much, the females won't prefer them. But well, what we can do is we can inject the females with dopamine that triggers this reward system. And now the female who's doped up in a sense, now she will respond to calls, that, to synthetic calls that normally she wouldn't respond to before. So we, sh we show that, you know, just like humans, that their reward system could, can be hijacked mm -hmm. um, by other kinds of sounds. And this probably fuels the evolution for these, you know, novel and bizarre additions that we can make to their calls. Yeah. Now, uh, of course, um, we humans, we, we can, you know, use prosthetics and, and kind of manipulate things uh, without maybe some of the penalties that would these animals would encounter. And, you know, as, as someone who's interested primarily in, in, in humans, um, you know, these, these insights seem to, uh, 
help explain some of the things that we see around us in the way in which you know humans are are manipulating themselves uh, in, in order to appear more more beautiful. And I wonder if you know we're we're all kind of hopped up on dopamine all the time, right? <laughs> Artificially, uh, you yeah. know whether whether that's that's changing our conceptions of, of beauty. Uh, well, can, you know, we we start to uh, brainwash children at least about what female beauty should be by giving them Barbie dolls. You know, there's this, uh, if you blow a Barbie up, at least the older Barbie dolls, if you blow an, a Barbie doll up to human size, given, given how skinny her legs are and given the rest of her build, she would have to walk on all fours. And she only only would have a small part of a kidney because her hips are so narrow. And would she, she even be able, able to keep her head up, head up off the, she off the ground? Yeah, she, can, she wouldn't be able to keep her head up. And she wouldn't be able to reproduce because her birth canal would be, uh, would be too narrow for, for a, a child to pass through. And, but we're telling, we're telling young girls, this is, you know, you want to grow up to be beautiful? This is, this is, what, beautiful, this is what beauty is. And also, too, when we look at male and, and female, men and women models, you know, they're not super normal stimuli in the sense that they actually do exist. But they're taken from really small uh, tail of the curve, right, of what, of what uh, humans look like. I mean, when Bizelle, uh, Giselle Bunchen, um, Tom Brady's wife, when she was making lots and lots of money, I think she was uh, maybe five foot ten, five foot eleven, and weighed about 120 pounds. I mean, you know, that's you know, that's not from the middle of the distribution of uh, of what women look like. So we, you know, we do. We are get we do get hijacked by these kind of supernormal stimuli, just like the animals do. Well, and, and this relates, I think, to what uh, you described the peak shift displacement, right? So, uh, so this this shows up with you know distinguishing males and females among other um, among other examples, right? Right. Yeah, and that's um, so with with zebra finches. The males have these orange beaks and the females have a pale beak. So the offspring learn who's a male and who's a female by imprinting on the beak of their, the color of the beak of their mother and their father. So if you look at female mate choice later on, you would think they would prefer a beak color that's close to their father's. Well, but the peak shift displacement, what they prefer is an orange beak that's very different from their mother. So it's even more orange than their father's. And, in, and you know, we, it's just speculation, but in, in humans, we, um, female attraction is often based on those traits of females that make them females. And with women preferring males, it's often on traits that are also sexually dimorphic. You know, the uh, the outline of the male's jaw is, uh, you know, is one example. But besides other things like just, you know, a distribution of muscles, etc. And so you the you have in some studies women preferring male men who look the most manly and men prefer, preferring female phenotypes that look the most feminine. And that usually means the least masculine. Mm -hmm. Well, when you talk about the different senses, I, I found a lot, lot of interesting insights. Um, you talk about vision, you talk about sounds, you talk about smells. Um, and, uh, and all in all three of these, there are these underlying kind of mechanisms, neural mechanisms that are being exploited. Um, so I was wondering if we could kind of walk through all of these in in, in the world of, of vision, in, in particular. Right, there's a lot of um, talk about symmetry, like fluctuating asymmetry in uh, the, the world of of neuroaesthetics. Um, and there's been all sorts of theories about why we we might like symmetry. And uh, also, I think you talk about how 
um, you know, things that look like faces. We humans have a, a kind of propensity to kind of look towards things that, that look like faces. You even mentioned that the the alphabets of the of the world have certain kind of consistent um, characteristics, which tap into um, our kind of propensity to, to to look at or at least differentiate uh, certain types of 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 shapes. Yeah. So the um, so you know we use obviously we use our visual system to read alphabets to read words, but our visual systems didn't evolve to be optimized for reading, of course. It evolved to extract useful information from the environment. So in this very clever study by this guy, Changizi and his colleagues, um, originally at Caltech, now, now he's in industry. What they did is they surveyed natural scenes and they looked at simple repeating patterns in nature. And then they compared that to a very large number of alphabets. And what they found is the angles of the strokes and the number of the strokes used for letters really seem to match up, match the most common uh, small patterns that we see in nature. And now there's a there's a more recent idea, which um, which came out after after this book that I wrote called Perceptual Fluency. And this idea, which is, which is um, a human, uh, which is a neural aesthetic study, humans, that when we see patterns that we can perceive more simply, and by simply, what they mean is the amount of uh, neural firing in the brain, that we actually derive hedonic pleasure from looking at these. So when artists do portraits of faces, the portraits of faces tend to be skewed a little bit and they're skewed to vision, the, um, the algorithms that we use to decipher visual, uh, visual scenes. So it seems that in humans, our, our evolutionary history of extracting information from nature is rewarded by this uh, hedonic feeling when we perceive things quite easily. And now there's some data, now there's some data in fishes uh, to show that that's true, where the, the pa pigment pattern of male fishes, these are called daughters, those actually map well onto the uh, habitat statistics of what the habitat is like, whereas the female the uh, female patterns do not do that. And in this species, it's the females that are that are choosing the males. So there's a lot of a lot of high level cognitive biases and cognitive processes that people are just starting to uh, to look at now. And this field of neuroaesthetics is, um, you know, is very popular right now. And people like myself working with animals, um, we're learning a lot by paying attention to neuroaesthetics. Um, as true, you know, a number of years ago, we started paying attention to um, behavioral economics. Mm -hmm. And we started paying more attention to human psychophysics. And those three areas, neuroaesthetics, psychophysics, and uh, behavioral economics has really enriched how, at least for some of us, how we look at these, uh, this taste for the beautiful that Darm suggested was so important in driving sexual selection. So now what is it about symmetry? I mean, I've, I've learned that um, our, our preference for symmetry, and I think it's a well-known regular phenomenon that people are more attracted to others, other people who are more symmetrical. Um, the, and so the standard theory was that this meant that you had uh, the ability to withstand kind of stressors of various kinds in, during fetal development, right? Is, 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 this, is this still the prevailing view or is, is there uh, kind of – could the preference for symmetry uh, preexist this, this signal? It can it can certainly pre, it can certainly preexist this signal. I mean, do we do we prefer symmetric fruit? You know, <laughs> is that is that 
is there anything better about symmetric fruit than than asymmetric fruit uh, when we're we're out foraging? Well, well, we process it, we process it more easily. Mm-hmm. So, uh, cognitive neuroscientists uh, have talked about the advantages of symmetry that you have information on the left being um, duplicated by information on the right, and this therefore makes it easier to recognize, more less likely to make mistakes. So it's more like the platonic ideal, right? So when we see something that looks more like the pl- platonic ideal of, of what we're, um, you know, what we're, what we're looking for, then it, it kind of requires less mental effort. Less mental effort is a good thing. It makes us feel a little better and, and uh, conserves a little mental energy for other things. Is that, is that the basic idea? Yeah. And saves, you know, um, saves metabolic energy. Neurons use a lot, a lot of our energy. Our brains use a huge amount of our da- of our da- daily energy allocation, but but the idea that symmetry might also signal something about the animal's genome, its ability to buffer, as you said, you know, environmental insults during development. That that certainly seems to be true. So and they started to they started to recognize this when they were breeding fishes in fisheries. And of course, you know, they're not worried about inbreeding because they're just going to let these fish go and people are going to catch them and eat them. So sometimes the inbreeding coefficient can get pretty high in these fisheries. And what they found is with more inbreeding, you get uh, more fluctuating asymmetries. So that phenomenon is real. And there are, uh, there are instances where females attraction to males can be influenced by the male symmetry. But there's also these cognitive mechanisms that are important. So these these are not mutually exclusive mm-hmm. explanations. Um, you know, there's lot there might be lots of signals in in a human's or an animal's body about um vigor. And some of them we're probably just blind to, you know, we we just don't see them. We don't smell them. Mm-hmm. Um, we don't hear them. Well, speaking of sound, I think this was, to me, this was the, the most interesting uh, chapter because, and, and it probably reflects your, you know, interest in in, uh, in the frogs uh, and their croaking, which, by the way, I, I frequently use frogs in my class, uh, frog mating in my class, and and every now and then uh, I'll get a student to um, to croak uh, for me, but it's it's never been as good, I have to say, as as, as your croak. I think um, <laughs> <laughs> so. Um, so you know, some of the things that I learned that I thought were, were fascinating uh, were, were that um, the hormones of, of females are uh, affected and manipulated by the the sounds of of the males, and this can kind of you know get them uh, more prepared or or, or more ready for. Um, for reproduction, uh, and this this is sort of a, a direct manipulation. Uh, and other things that I, I learned were um, had to do with short sounds versus long sounds. So you know, I, I I ride horses, and so you know, you got like you know, giddy up, and then you got whoa, and uh, th- this is not a cultural construct, right? And this is something that you see right. kind of across the animal kingdom, right? In domesticated animals, so for instance, this is true in horses. And it's also the, the same in sled dogs. And um, the, woman who, the woman who did this study quite a while ago showed that with the sled dogs, you could raise them to recognize the go signal and make it, but they, rec- they would stop. And then you could train them to go with the normal stop signal. So you could train them as puppies to do this. But then as adults, if you want to flip them, to what is the the more typically used signals, stop and whoa, whoa, and go, go, go. They flip very easily. But if you take adult sled dogs in that learn the quote unquote correct association, they you can't they can't be flipped. So even though the, so there's learning involved, there's training and uh, training can reverse this, but there's also a very strong um, genetic disposition. You know, and I mean, most of us in biology, we don't worry about nature versus nurture anymore. We don't think that's a conflict because, you know, we think that everything has some kind of gene by environment interaction. So nothing's pure, nothing 
is purely nurture and nothing is purely nature. And, uh, but this, but these genetic predispositions, you know, even in animals that are learning can be very important in, in having a, a genetic disposition to learn some things more easily than others. Well, well, songbirds seem to have culture, right? Uh, the, the songs of, of the birds are, um, distinctly local, right? And that, uh, they can be sort of inherited from their uh, parents, right? Um, and absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you're at Berkeley, the best example in, uh, in North America of this, this song culture is out on Point Reyes over a walk of a couple of hundred meters. There's several populations of white crowned sparrows that even if, even if you don't have a trained ear, which I certainly don't for those birds, uh, you can hear you can hear the differences. So songbirds learn their song, and we know that whenever you learn something, there's a possibility of making a mistake, and then these mistakes, which don't influence the animal survivorship at all, these mistakes then just get propagated throughout the population. And then you get these different song cultures, you know, very, very much like uh, like differences of accent mm-hmm. or differences in dialects in humans. And so this, this, this variety serves some kind of purpose too, right? So it helps you to distinguish in group from out group. I think uh, among anthropologists, uh, uh, they've made this point that um, accent is a great way to identify, you know, a, a foreigner or identify somebody from a different tribe or a different group, right? Yeah, I mean, you think of My Fair Lady and, you know, and the the, uh, the assumptions about socioeconomic class being tied into dialects in the, in the UK. Right, and so you can also tell, right, whether someone's healthy, someone's beautiful, someone's young. Um, even humans can do this, right? Yeah, and yeah, there's um, there there are certainly are certain aspects of just how we sound that say something that say something about us. So, for instance, you know, um, men and women have different dominant frequencies. Men tend to have lower voices than women, with the exception of Elizabeth Holmes in this Theranos trial and, uh, you know, and that's, that's obviously very affected. I mean, she's intentionally lowering her voice like any of us could, but, um, and then, then other, then of course, dialects too, uh, just give a a whole lot of information. In my book, I give an example uh, of a study done in Scotland where they have, um, they read, a phrase, no, I'm sorry, they're played a phrase by someone from um, a higher and a lower socioeconomic class. And the they just hear the audio and the women are asked which which um, voices do they find more attractive? And it's and it's the ones from the higher uh, socioeconomic classes. Mm-hmm. And so you can also uh, engage in some manipulation, right? So the, some of the uh, greatest examples were that um, you know when you're projecting a sound, right? You can use the environment to make that sound, uh, you know, deeper or make it make it louder or project it further. And so the, these animals are kind of like um, engineers, right? They they build out environments to kind of create echoes. And uh, I think the bowerbirds they create these these long paths so that, you know, when they're standing, they're sort of standing at the end of the path, it makes them, makes them look bigger, right? Exactly. Yeah. There's like animals are able to really um, take advantage of perceptual illusions to, uh, you know, to make themselves look bigger with the bower birds. They arrange rocks, the size of the rocks in a certain order. And this gives what's called forced perception. So like the uh, Cinderella castle at Disneyland, the windows at the very top are smaller than the windows at the bottom. So we know that something that's farther away should be, uh, should appear smaller, but this hijacks that algorithm that we use. And we think that building is much larger, much taller than it really is. And the bowerbirds, it's the same thing. They, 
have this forced perspe perspective. So the females think the males are actually much larger than they are. And then, then animals will dig burrows and they'll not only call from the burrow, but they'll call from the burrow so that their call is one wavelength mm -hmm. away from the entrance to the burrow, which really maximizes the resonant properties, the echoes that you get out of those burrows. And, um, and the Mayans, and I think the Aztecs as well, they would have areas where they would have meetings and the speaker could stand in a certain spot and then his voice would be amplified uh, to the crowd. So yeah, these, uh, these tricks have been used, uh, have been used for a while in both vision and sound. Well, you talked about one species of bird that migrates right across the hemispheres and they change their song because the, the environment is, is different, right? They go from, you know, one type of forest to, to another. And so, uh, the, to, to get optimal projection, they need to kind of change the way they, they sing. And, and I think you mentioned also that if you put frogs in a little, you know, uh, little cavity and then you adjust the, the level of the water, they'll adjust the level of their song kind of automatically to, to calibrate to the, to the volume of the, of the kind of cubby hole that they're in. Yeah. So they call in tree holes and the frequency of their calls that are going to resonate the best depend on the space in the tree hole. And these tree holes can fill with water. So the, the researchers showed in real time, as you pump water into the bottom of this and the water goes up and the space decreases, then the birds change their, um, the birds change their frequency to match the resonance. And, you know, there's a really wonderful COVID example the amount of traffic over the Golden Gate Bridge has changed drastically, uh, first of all, over the years. And then, oh, then with the pandemic, it's dropped to about 1970, um, 1970 values, measures of traffic. And white-crowned sparrows, again, the white-crowned sparrows in that area of San Francisco and also on the other side, Marin, They've now changed the, uh, the pitch, the frequency of their call, and they've dropped it because now there's not as much noise for them to worry about. So now their songs sound like white-crowned sparrows that live in rural areas where you don't have all this traffic noise. And if, uh, if we ever get out of this pandemic, it'll be real. I'm sure the person who did this study, Elizabeth Derryberry, is going to uh, keep measuring the traffic noise and keep measuring the bird song and see how well the bird songs, um, you know, are tracking these holes in this anthropogenic, uh, anthropogenic noise so they can maximize um, their contrast, you know, their acoustic contrast to the background. Well, I think my favorite, uh, or you know, the, the strangest study that you reference having to do with sound had to do with, uh, I think the, the kind of, I think they played various types of classical music and had people watch pornography and, and apparently you, you could elicit a different response with right major versus versus minor sounds okay now is that I mean most people would think that um, the association between say major and, and minor with different kind of affects is is sort of a, a cultural construction it, do we have any reason to think it's it's something other than than a cultural artifact no, no, I not at not at the level of the brain um, that I know of. We know that there's really interesting aspects of uh, musical scales, for instance, that match on to the important frequency peaks in our voice. Mm -hmm. So it seems that musical notes are chosen to match aspects of human speech. But, and we do know for sure, right, that different kinds of music elicit different kinds of emotion. I mean, the, uh, the blues key is called the blues because it makes you feel bluesy. But whether that's cultural or not, it's, um, you know, it's, it's really, it is really hard to tell. You do get, you do get the feeling that martial music, um, you know, that they use to motivate people 
in the armed forces to march and to fight, you do get a feeling that when you hear that, it does really want make you want to get up and, and move and not dance move, but, you know, march move. But, but that, you know, that also could be cultural. But these effects, you know, that I talked about in the book, when people, first they hear this classical music and different people hear diff, different men, it's a study of men, hear different types of music and then they view pornography and their response to the pornography is very different. So if they're hearing romantic music, they have one response. If they're hearing martial music, then uh, another response or something in a major key versus a minor key. Now, I want to talk about uh, sort of aromas and smells. Um, I've talked to a bunch of people on this uh, podcast about uh, smell, um, the probably least appreciated smell of a sense of, of all among us, us humans, but certainly not underappreciated among the rest of the animal kingdom. Um, and, and, you know, I, I think that, um, what, what some people are probably wondering first and foremost is, right, are, are pheromones, uh, something that, that humans also, um, you know, have to deal with or is, are, are, is it, are pheromones something that, that humans have left behind? I know you're not, you're not an expert on humans, but that's always the thing that most people want to know about because pheromones seem to be these incredibly powerful things that can go across many, you know, many, many miles uh, and, and that uh, animals can detect them at very, in very, very, very small number, very, very small quantities. And, and also, you know, the perfume industry is a billion dollar industry, right? So that's certainly tapping into the potency of, of odors influencing our behavior. And pro one of the most interesting aspects of, uh, of human pheromones has to do with this complex of genes that we have, major histocompatibility genes. These are the genes that run the immune system. Every, every animal has them, right? Every animal, yeah, every, certainly every vertebrate, and I think some invertebrates have them. And these are associated with odor. So there's this famous study called the Stinky T-Shirt Study and they had, um, you know, these were done with college students, like a lot of these studies. They would have guys wear these T-shirts for a few days and not bathe and not use any cologne. And then the T-shirts were put in plastic bags. And then women would smell these plastic bags and rate the sexual attractiveness of the different odors, the different shirts. Now, what they also did is they analyzed their MHC genes. So they knew the MHC genes of the women and the MHC genes of the men. And the women preferred the odors of men whose MHC genes were the most different from theirs. Now, one of the key aspects of MHC is that it's the most variable gene in the vertebrate kingdom. And this genetic variation is very important, in helping it to recognize pathogens um, when they enter the body. So from a genetic engineering point of view, if you wanted to maximize MHC variation in your offspring, which should promote your offspring's health, then you would want to partner with someone whose MHC genes are different than yours and it appears that they're that they're hooked up uh, that they're hooked up to odors and then in follow-up studies they've shown that people with similar MHC genes tend to prefer similar types of uh, of perfumes mm -hmm. so the perfumes do seem to be um, you know plugging into, something that we have there that's related to uh to to sexual behavior and, and i think uh when women are on birth control this mechanism flips right so the 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 attraction to kind of different mhc genes goes away and is replaced with a kind of homophily right and and as you point out this could lead to some um maybe disappointing marriages, right? If, uh, if, if the screening process doesn't uh, take place, right? Uh, yeah. yeah. 
and the the idea is you know i just explained why if you're if you're interested in maximizing the health of your children then you know you prefer a partner with different mhc but the idea is well then once you have children you want to be attracted to people with similar mhc genes it's kind of you know it takes a village to raise a child and that village is usually close relatives and so yeah there's the, that's the speculation that if people uh, fall in love while the woman is on birth control and then the woman stops using birth control now her uh, MHC bouquet is going to change and is there any evidence for higher divorce rates there mm -hmm. there is some suggestion that in Scandinavia that maybe so but maybe not so it's uh, you know it's an interesting prediction it's not a well borne out prediction yet Mm -hmm. And I think my favorite example in, in this part of the book was how these, um, these bees, right, uh, they bathe in, in the scent of uh, orchids in order to make themselves more attractive. And the ironic thing is that the, the orchids were, were, you know, trying to make themselves more attractive by uh, smelling more like bees. Yeah, so these orchids, these particular kinds of orchids are called deceptive orchids for a good reason. They don't produce nectar. That's usually the uh, the payoff to an animal. You know, the animal visits the flower. The pollinator visits the flower to get nectar. And when it's getting nectar, then the pollen gets on the pollinator. And then it ha brings that to the next flower, you know, unintentionally. What these deceptive orchids do is they produce chemicals that mimic the smell of bees. And in fact, these chemicals, in some cases smell more like bees than bees do mm -hmm. smell more like bees than virgin bees do and then you know the next logical step is that you know being a, being uh, anthropomorphic the bees figure some of the bees figure this out so when they go to the orchid they actually take the odors from the orchid and then they rub it on their bodies which then makes them uh which then makes them more attractive to to conspecifics to members of the opposite sex so it's a crazy uh, it's a crazy system for the orchids it still works out fine the male's still getting pollen and moving it from orchid to orchid but the orchids have become so good at smelling like a bee that they smell more like the bees than the bees do and the bees then take advantage of it so they become this pharmacopoeia of beef pheromones they, they open up like a perfume shop right basically. exactly yeah yeah exactly exactly and i think you mentioned this one example of, of a bee that found itself stranded in an area where there were none of these orchids and so managed to kind of cook up a a, a, a replica perfume sourced from a whole bunch of other orchids yeah yeah this was a bee a species that's uh, native to costa rica and it got, you know, transported probably with plants or, or uh, produce to Florida. And yeah, and this, there were no orchids, that species of orchid. So then they just put together a whole bunch of ingredients from all of these different plants to compensate and, and mimic their, you know, mimic these pheromones fairly well. So, you know, this example of MHC, I mean, this, this is uh, where... Um, don't have simple assortative attraction, right? So it seems like in all of the right. other examples, right, when, when you're talking about beauty, right, visual beauty, auditory beauty, and so forth, there seems to be some, some consensus uh, around, you know, what is more and what is less beautiful. And so you could potentially even kind of rank order all of the, the males uh, and, 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 you know, most of the females would kind of subscribe to that rank ordering. Uh, but with respect to MHC, there's this kind of, you know, heterogeneity in preferences. Is, is there evidence of, of heterogeneity in preferences in, in the other domains? Or, you know, why, yeah, why don't we see every, all the females simply converge on a single male? Is it because it doesn't seem like it would be a capacity constraint? Yeah, there, I mean, there, there are, there are other examples. So, so, when we, you know, when we're talking about good genes before genes for vigor, 
Well, that's the example that you point out. There's good genes and not so good genes and bad genes, regardless of who the female is. But then there's also complementary genes like MHC. So when there's complementary genes, then you get this kind of assortative mating. So, I mean, one kind of assortative mating uh, that we talked about earlier on is mating with your own species rather than another species. But there's other kinds. In humans, there's a strong assortative mating by height. Mm -hmm. in, uh, in some animals, like frogs, there's, uh, there can be assortative mating by body size. And the reason being that in frogs, the male gets on top of the female and clasps her. She releases her eggs into the water. The male releases his sperm. And if there's a mismatch in size, either the male's way big or the male's way small, then the sperm's not going to uh, contact as many of the eggs. So there's a sort of mating there. And there's an example with birds where the, the uh, females use both a visual cue and an auditory cue when they assess males. So the male's um, plumage and display and the male's song and the um, females vary in how good their hearing is, and females vary in how good their eyesight is. And the females, this leads the females to have different preferences. So the females with better hearing weight the song more than the plumage, and females with better, better eyesight weight the plumage more than the song. So this would be one way to, again, some kind of, it's, and it, it is a type of assortative mating. And it's also going to maintain variation among the males. There's not going to be one super attractive male um, because females prefer different combinations of these traits. Right. And towards the end of the book, you talk about how um, preferences can be kind of variable, right? Or, or fickle. Um, and uh, this is usually a function of constraints, right? So as uh, creatures get, get older, they, they kind of change their preferences, right? As their kind of mating season um, kind of draws to a close, they uh, kind of change their, their, their preferences. Um, and, and also they start to, they, they learn from, from others, right? So they'll look around and kind of see what, what others are, 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 are looking at um, and, uh, and, and copy, right? So there's make choice copying, and I think that the, the other thing that I, I found really interesting was the, the phantom decoy effect, which, you know, we see as an irrationality, uh, and it's been studied fairly well in humans. Animals seem to fall prey to the to the same thing. And, and I guess the only possible explanation for that is what cognitive ease of, of computation. Yeah, there's there's a, for for this cognitive decoy idea is, you know, the the assumption is that the re, if you have two individuals or an econ or an economics two products to choose from the preference uh the relative preference of a over b should not be influenced whether there's a third alternative and then what we find is if there is a third all if there is a third alternative then the, that can actually flip the preferences so i mean uh, you know, just a simple example in uh if you offer somebody a trip to France and a trip to a trip to Paris and a trip to Rome, a free trip and free breakfast uh, for your whole vacation there, some people might have a hard time deciding. But if you add a third alternative, and that alternative is a free trip to Rome but no free breakfast, now that makes the trip to Rome with the free breakfast seem more attractive. Mm -hmm than the trip to Paris with a free breakfast. It's crazy. And, and, uh, and, and animals do this. We've shown this with the frogs that we work with. We give them two calls. We just call them A and B, and the females don't show a strong preference. And then we add another call to the mix, C, which we know ahead of time is an unattractive call. And then it causes the females to switch their preference um, uh, to now show a strong preference for B, even if they actually had a preference for A. And it's probably, we don't understand exactly what they're doing, but it might be how their 
measuring a particular part of a sound or a visual display and using this third option as kind of a baseline metric. Um, but it's um, but it but it is common. Mm -hmm. Now the the mate choice the mate choice copying is really interesting. I mean, there's two possibilities with mate choice copying. One is it's an adaptation to get better mates to choose better mates, and you know, and people have made the argument. Well, when you're co you're copying others because now you have more information around who is a good mate. So you integrate that information and you show mate choice copying. So they did a study in humans recently. It's not in my book. It came out afterwards. And they have people rate the attractiveness of a face. They have men do this and female and women do this. And these, uh, this is done in real time. You have a group of people all doing this on their separate computer. And then they get feedback. What was the average, what was the average rating of a face? And now, do you want to change your rating? And people do. And they change it by a certain percentage. I forget exactly what the percentage is, you know, in one direction. Then they repeat the same study with the same people and they show them hands. How do you rate the attractiveness of the hands? And then they get feedback and then they can change their ratings. And it's almost exactly the same amount that they change their rating. So then they do it with paintings. Same phenomenon. People rate, rate the paintings. When they get feedback, they do change it and they also change it by the same amount. So it seems that made choice copying could possibly be just one example of social facilitation, which is, you know, which we know is a common phenomenon in humans. And we know it's a common phenomenon in animals with feeding, for instance. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, mate choice copying is widespread, but we don't quite know yet if it's an adaptation or if, an, if it's just an incidental consequence on how we integrate all kinds of social information when we make decisions, meaning it might not be special to make choice. Right. I use this, I talk about this in my behavioral finance class where we, we talk about you know, you have a private signal and then you, you know, others have private signals and, and you have to weigh your private signal against the, the, the signal of others. But, but of course there, right, it's, the, the, you know, those experiments are done in, in the absence of a kind of a resale market. And when you add in the resale market, right, which is kind of like a proxy yeah. for sexual reproduction, then, then, you know, the, 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 the effect becomes that much stronger. Neat, neat. Mm-hmm. And so the, the, the final example used in the book has to do with, um, you know, again, getting back to these manipulations. And, and sometimes with, there are inadvertent manipulations, right? So you talk about how there were these experimenters that had, you know, different colored uh, bands that they put on the, on the different birds. And then this led to kind of differences in, in, in preferences, right? That revealed differences in preferences that were sort right. of hidden. Uh, and... And I thought the, the, the most interesting insight there is that maybe we have, you know, we have to go back and revisit all of our experiments, right? Because maybe, you know, this is something that we haven't been tracking. I, I, I read recently someone said that, you know, we, we probably need to go back and look at the gender of the experimenters uh, because the, of the hormones, you know, when a, when a male experimenter walks into the room of rats, they're pushing off this gigantic flume of, of, of testosterone and they might get differential effects. So if, you know, if you have a male experimenter with the treatment group and a female experimenter with the control group, then, you know, the, the differences that you get might be due simply to the, the gender of the uh, experimenter. And, and I guess here, you know, if you, if you have any kind of uh, difference in, in, in band color, right. That's, you know, that was done, uh, with it, without it, you know, purely innocently, it might actually screw up the results of your test. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And with the, and with that initial band bird band color study, these are with zebra finches again that have the orange beaks. And when they put a red or an orange band on a male, it makes them more attractive to the females, whereas a green makes them less attractive. Green band would make them less attractive. So the idea is that, sure, females prefer males with orange beaks, but females just have this hidden preference for orange, period. So if you adorn these males 
with orange all over their body, you're just going to make them more and more attractive. Um, this idea of, um, of experimenters, you know, throwing off human pheromones, which, you know, you wouldn't have to worry about that with many animals, but you certainly would have to worry about that with studies of mammals. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Yeah. Actually, I actually hadn't thought of that. That's a, that's a really good point. Now, you, you, you presumably, when you were down in, in Panama studying your frogs, I think you mentioned in the book that you, you went out and you had to mark them all so that you could kind of keep, keep track. Did, did, yeah. did, did those mark, did you, did those markings, did it occur that maybe those markings were, were influencing things? How did you, were the, were the, first of all, I want to know, how the heck do you go out and mark all these frogs? I mean, that just sounds like a pretty, uh, pretty, pretty, pretty crazy endeavor. Well, while, you know, what we do, this, this will sound a little barbaric. Uh, but frogs aren't people. What we do is we make toe clips. So you just clip off a little part of a toe. And they don't show any reaction to it. We can't assume that they're not feeling pain, but they don't show any reaction to it. And we do those toe clips after we do the experiments with the frogs. So we collect the frogs in the field. We bring them into our lab in Panama, play the mating calls, do our experiments. Then we put them back that same night where we found them. And the reason that we do these toe clips is so we don't test them again. Mm -hmm. So, um, so yeah, toe clipped animals never get, uh, never do get tested again. So and then work that we do with bats, we put in little, uh, cause they're bigger. And then we can put in little, uh, uh, little transponder tags. So then when we catch the bat, you just have to swipe them with a, uh, a detector to see if they have one of these uh, one of these transponders. Well, lots of interesting insights about uh, about beauty. Um, and, and I think, um, you know, all of us are interested in beauty, right? All of us are, are, are seeking out beauty. I, I think you, you talk about how our um, dopamine center creates reward whenever we're surrounded by kind of any, any type of, of, of beauty. And I think that um, the non-biological sciences can certainly learn a lot from, from biology. You've learned a lot from kind of social science, uh, and yeah. you learned a lot from uh, the study of how, how humans interact with the world. Do, do, you see a, um, do you see a corresponding flow of insight going in the other direction? Have you spoken a lot to people in, in the social sciences? Yeah, well, well I do. We have... Um you know, one of the founders of the field of evolutionary psychology right here, David Buss. And, um, and I'm, I'm writing a chapter for a book that David Buss is putting out. And that's specifically um, the framework of the chapter is that most of evolutionary psychology is drawing from evolutionary theory based on animals and asking to what degree does this apply to humans? Uh, so that's really the stronger flow of information from animal studies to human. Whereas, um, you know, what I was emphasizing and what we've been doing a lot of is in the opposite direction. Um, there's about four or five or six different studies that we've done that have been motivated totally by studies uh, on humans and usually more mechanistic studies of humans. Like hearing, uh, hearing, seeing voices and hearing lips. We've been very interested in how information from visual, uh, visual stream and acoustic stream can get kind of mixed up and give wrong information. So that's, uh, there's fewer people going in that direction from uh, what we know about humans and applying it to us, to the animals. Uh, and, the, and the studies of humans that we're interested in are not studies of, uh, you know, the adaptive significance of human behavior as opposed to what have uh, people in cognitive neuroscience and behavior like economics and psychophysics, what phenomena do they uncover in humans? And, are, and can we find these phenomena in, uh, in, in animals? Well, Mike, thanks so much for joining me. I, I think there's there's a there's a budding self help book in here. There's a budding bestseller about you know uh, lessons around beauty that we can take well, from frogs this, and yeah, birds. This, yeah, this is really fun. It's really and it's very rewarding to talk to someone who actually read the book. <laughs> <laughs>
No, it was it was uh, unput put downable. I was uh, taking taking all sorts of notes. I wish I'd had these tips when I was when I was younger. I, I think I could, yeah, I could, have, I could have profited yeah. from them. <laughs> yeah, me too. All right. Well, thanks so much. Hope to see you again soon. Okay, you're quite welcome. Thank thank you kindly. Bye bye. This is Unsilo, brought to you by Alumni FM, connecting people through stories.